In this lecture, we will be discussing the surgical correction of traumatic proptosis if the eye is still assessed as functional. Globe replacement is considered if the eye is showing intact reflexes or the anatomical damage can be fixed and restored. Let's begin. Operative site preparation before surgery is pretty standard for all kinds of surgical procedures, but extra care in this case is placed on the eye area. A generous amount of ophthalmic ointment is lathered on the corneal surface before hair is clipped. You may opt for an ophthalmic antibiotic ointment or a simple sterile eye gel. The hair is clipped liberally around the eye to make sure that no hair will get into the eye and if you need to expand your incision, you have your surgical site prepared. The cornea and conjunctival sac is thoroughly washed with warm sterile saline or lactated ringer solution to flush out any hair and or debris that are stuck. For the skin surrounding the eye, you may prep this with a very dilute povidone iodine. The color of the solution must resemble a very light brown color, like a very weak tea. Remember not to use povidone iodine or other chemical preparations like chlorhexidine on the ocular surfaces because this can cause corneoconjunctival ulceration. You may use a sterile, cotton-tipped applicator soaked in saline or LRS to wipe the margins and fornices if they are accessible. Globe replacement starts with a lateral canthotomy. By its name, it means an incision is made on the lateral canthus of the eye to enlarge or expand the whole palpebral fissure. This increases the exposure of the globe for better surgical access. As seen in this image on the right, a number 15 scalpel blade may be used or a pair of mayo scissors. You need to be careful to use the blunt end of the scissors on the inside of the orbit to prevent doing unnecessary damage to the intact structures. Before we go to globe replacement, we need to discuss the first part of temporary tersorophy. Tersorophy entails the suturing of the upper and lower eyelids together. It can be done in two ways, partial or complete. In a complete tersorophy, the entire length of the eyelids are closed, while in a partial tersorophy, a hole is left either on the medial, the lateral, or the central part of the eye. This is indicated for corneal ulcerations, removal of corneal masses, eyelid lacerations, and proptosis. Closing the eyelids together provides protection to the corneal surface by reducing its exposure to the environment and possibility of mechanical abrasion. It also limits tear evaporation and allows maximized contact of topical medications on the eye. This is one of the advantages of partial tersorophy over complete tersorophy. You may administer these eye medications through the hole that you left, and you may also assess a part of the cornea during the healing period. To start the tersorophy, you will pre-place two to four partial thickness horizontal mattress sutures across the palpebral fissure. These sutures are placed to have a better grasp on the eyelids when we are trying to replace the globe back to the orbit later. So how is this done? You will need a 4-0 or a 5-0 non-absorbable monofilament suture and stents, which we discussed in the lecture about skin tension. Stent in the left side image is made from wide rubber bands, but it can also be used using IV line tubings. You need to place your suture in a certain direction, 
number one, through the stent, through the upper eyelid, five millimeters from the margin, exiting through the meibomian glands, which is placed on the anterior part of the eyelid, crossing over to the lower eyelid, entering through the meibomian glands of this area, exiting five millimeters away from the margin, and through another stent. This process is repeated until the two stents are secured on both eyelids. Remember, do not secure the suture just yet, or do not tie your knot just yet. This is another view of how the suture should appear within the eyelid. Suture goes through a stent, five millimeters away from the margin, enter. Partial thickness suture bites mean that your needle should not penetrate this tissue right here, should be within. Crossing over to the lower eyelid, entering through the glands, exiting five millimeters away from the margin and into another stent, and the same way going back. Why is it important that you use partial thickness suture bites? Contact with a suture if you are going to let it penetrate through the eyelid. The suture that will be left here will be in contact with the cornea and may cause more damage to the corneal surface. If you want to treat a corneal ulceration by suturing the eyelids closed so that the cornea can heal, your suture might just be making the condition worse. Focusing on the stents. Stents may be made from a thick rubber band, buttons, or ivy line tubing cut into short pieces. It serves three main functions. Number one, it reduces the skin tension from the suture material. It limits the possibility of suture pull-through, skin tearing, and subsequent breakdown of the tersorophy. It also helps prevent pressure necrosis of the eyelids. Remember, these eyelids may be inflamed after the eye is proptosed. When they are attempted to be closed, they can be really friable and tear apart easily. Stents help address this problem. Now, how do we actually put back an eye into an orbit when it has been displaced outward? This is where your pre-placed sutures would come in handy. Secure the ends of the sutures with a pair of hemostatic forceps so you have a better grip. But if you trust your hands and your fingers to do it, then that will do. A lubricated scalpel handle is then placed between the sutures and the cornea as shown in the picture on the left. You must try not to press down too much on the cornea to prevent further damage. Now, you will gently pull on the sutures upward to bring the eyelids into a closed position over the globe. The scalpel handle will prevent the forward or upward movement of the globe when the eyelids are pulled up. The scalpel handle, being a flat, smooth instrument, can also prevent the suture from irritating the cornea. Once the globe is replaced back into the orbital cavity, the eye must be washed with sterile saline or LRS to clean any blood on it. The conjunctiva and the conjunctival sacs need to be washed as well. Once done, do a last check on the eye and its associated structures. Once you are satisfied, tighten and tie each pre-placed suture. You may secure this with a surgeon's knot reinforced with extra square knots. For a partial tersorophy, which is indicated in such cases, you may choose between the medial canthus, 
the lateral canthus or the middle aspect of the eyelids to be left open for the administration of topical medications. This is an illustration of the surgery from the lateral canthotomy to replacing of the sutures for temporary tersorophy, the manner of globe replacement, and closure. Wouldn't it be cool if we can see this done in an actual clinical case? Yep, another video assignment. Sadly, I was going to attach the video on the slide, but my PowerPoint keeps on crashing. So we're just going to make it into a video assignment. Watch this video of repair of canine proptosis to see how globe replacement is done on a real patient. Please note the differences in the technique and in the instruments that they did from the protocol that we just discussed. After the procedure, analgesics and sedatives must be readily available if you anticipate a rough recovery. You must remember that the feeling of pain and the consequent anxiety for patients increases their systemic blood pressure, which will in turn cause hemorrhage and an increase in the intraocular pressure, which is not good for our eye surgery patients. You must closely monitor the respiratory rate and effort of these patients, including the color of their mucous membranes and oxygen saturation, to make sure that there is adequate circulation. Of course, the recovery plan will also be dependent on the other injuries the patient has. Post-operative therapy usually includes systemic antibiotics, anti-inflammatory medications, and analgesics. In addition to those, a topical antibiotic ointment for the eye is also prescribed to be given every six hours. Atropine is also a part of the therapeutic plan. Atropine, given every eight to 12 hours, causes the eye muscles to relax. It dilates the pupil, so it will not respond to light to reduce pain after surgery. NSAIDs are also found to reduce the possibility of exophthalmos from retrobulbar and optic nerve swelling. Sutures must be maintained in place for at least two weeks, up to four weeks, depending on the degree of damage inside. Any surgery has its own list of possible complications after. The most common for this is lagophthalmos. Does anyone know? What that is? Lagophthalmos is the medical term for the inability to close the eyelids completely. Lateral strabismus can also develop. It can be temporary or at times it is permanent. What is strabismus? Lateral strabismus is what we call pagkabanlag. On the other hand, medial strabismus is what we call Pagkaduling. So that is one of the complications as well. The optic nerve can also degenerate because of the traumatic damage. Lastly, if the eye will not heal, it will become shrunken and non-functional, which eventually needs to be removed. This condition is called the thysis bulbi. So, that is how we replace an eye back into the cavity. But what if the eye is so damaged and there is no function detected? That is our topic for the next video.